Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full Star Wars and or episodes one through episode three video. They just released the first three episodes. The series is gonna be 12 total. I'll be doing videos for all of them, so be sure to subscribe to get those. Careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen them yet, we'll start at the beginning and go through shot by shot talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments as we go along. And I will explain what's going on just in general with the series because most of you probably know this is meant to be a prequel to the events of Rogue One. Like that's why they say it takes place five years before the Battle of Yavin. That's what 5 BBY means. The events of Rogue One are meant to take place right before the events of A New Hope with them stealing the Death Star plans. Their whole plan for this series is that this will take place over the course of a couple years and then season two will cover the rest of the timeline right up to the beginning of Rogue One. Like the ending of the Andor series will be the very beginning of Rogue One. And they've already confirmed it will get a season two. Like they'll start filming it sometime soon. One of the other big differences in this series is that it's going to be 12 episodes. Normally the Star Wars Disney Plus series have been about eight episodes. So love the expanded run. Wish they did more episodes of The Mandalorian. Like The Mandalorian season three is gonna start in February. It'll still be eight episodes. But the whole idea with this series is that it's meant to show you how the rebellion formed because that's basically what's happening at the beginning of Rogue One. Like the rebellion is already the rebellion for the most part. When this series begins five years before that, they're still called the resistance. Like they haven't become the actual rebellion. They're gonna show you how that happened. Like all the legwork, the behind the scenes stuff and how that actually took place. Before the events of this series, they said canonically that there are three people that were critical in the formation of the Rebellion. There's Mon Mothma, who's a character during this series. You saw her a couple times in the trailer. Bail Organa, who will also probably show up at some point during this series. And then also Princess Leia. The only person I'm not sure how they're going to handle during this is Princess Leia. Because at this point in the timeline, I believe that she has not become an Imperial Senator yet. I don't think that happens for a couple more years. They had to recast a new young actress, but it'd be older than the version that we saw in Obi-Wan, like the little girl Leia. If they did that, then they could recast another version. We'll see how they handle it. But it's like with this series, they're trying to tell you that there's this fourth person in the creation of the Rebellion named Luthan Rail, played by Stellan Skarsgård, who's really behind everything. Like the person who got everyone else on board, all the important figures, into the idea of creating the Rebellion. The actual series was written by Tony Gilroy. Most of you will remember him as the person who basically fixed Rogue One and turned it into the movie that everybody loves so much today. Like it's one of the better Star Wars movies that they've done since Disney bought Star Wars. They actually just signed him to develop more Star Wars series beyond this, more live action series. So we don't know what those are going to be, but it should be pretty cool. But when I started making this video, like when they first uploaded the episodes to Disney Plus, they didn't have actual titles on the episodes. Like they were just called episode one, episode two, episode three. They might add actual titles later. Just starting with the events of the first episode, they start with the title screen and the brand new Andor theme. They did have different theme music that they did for each of the episodes. In the actual opening title scene, the planet that they start on, I believe, is meant to be the Kinari planet that he's from originally. And it morphs into the symbol of the rebellion because the whole series is about the creation of the rebellion. And because they go to so many different brand new planets that we haven't seen in Star Wars before, with a few exceptions, like they mentioned a couple familiar planets, but a lot of them at the beginning of the series here are brand new. They give you a lot of title cards, a lot of text to explain where you are, when you are in the timeline. So in the opening scene, Cassian Andor is on the Morlana 1 planet within the Preox Morlana corporate zone, which is basically like a group of planets in a system that a corporation owns, this Preox Morlana corporation. It's in the mid rim, but they want to show you that there are like a lot of large corporations out there that control big parts of the galaxy that also have to operate within the purview of the Empire. Like the Empire still controls everything, but the whole idea is that you have a lot of like really large corporations who are also pretty terrible. Like the Empire terrible, but corporations also pretty terrible too. Who want to have nothing to do with the Empire. Like that's a whole thing during the episode. We don't want them up in our business. It is bad for money. So like even the terrible corporations hate the Empire. But the first couple of episodes take place on a couple of different planets that this corporation controls. And he's coming to this planet trying to track down his sister that we see in the flashbacks. The Canari woman that he's looking for that he was separated from, like the little sister he was separated from when Marva basically took him or rescued him from the Republic. I'll explain the timeline with those flashbacks too. Like when is this taking place? When are these flashbacks happening? How old is he in present day? But they make it seem like this is just meant to be the seedy underbelly red light district of this corporate owned town. When he passes by the first alien, it sounds like she's speaking Huddies. In this whole first part of the episode, it's just meant to show you some of the quote unquote terrible things that Cassian Andor did in his past that he references during the events of Rogue One later. Like he says, I've done terrible things and he winds up killing these corporate people to try to shake him down. 
They just want to show you that the people who helped form the rebellion also did terrible things in the formation of the rebellion, just like the Empire did terrible things. So even though some of the figures in the Star Wars universe are meant to seem like truly good people, like Luke Skywalker, Leo Organa, meant to seem like truly good people, most of the regular people like Cassie and Andor, these are the like rank and file rebellion people, also did a lot of terrible stuff. Very morally gray. When they start talking about the Canari planet, they treat it like it's this huge deal meant to be this huge secret Cassian has been keeping his entire life ever since Marva saved him. When we start seeing the flashbacks though, I think that's meant to take place a little bit after the events or around the events of Phantom Menace. Just based on how old he seems, I believe he's meant to be in his 30s. Now like Diego Luna, who plays the character, is in his early 40s, but this is taking place earlier in the timeline from Rogue One. So that's why I say he's probably in his 30s. And I think the flashback version of him is just meant to be like early teenager, maybe a little bit younger than that. So like this would be before the events of the Clone Wars when this ship is crashing. So that's why they keep referring to the Republic ship that's coming to investigate the crash. Marvel also kind of makes it sound like the Republic is going to do some shady things too. Like they're going to round up all those kids and arrest them because they killed that Republic officer. The weird thing about his backstory that they don't completely explain yet, like we'll probably figure out the rest of it later. But the Imperial records state that it was an Imperial mining planet that they just mined for resources where there was an accident that rendered it hazardous for human occupation so nobody can go there anymore. They don't make it clear if it's meant to be a cover up and it was this particular ship crashing because like all the regular looking people have yellowed skin like they was an accident and that's what turned their skin yellow. But clearly these characters are all running around the ship and they're totally fine so it sounds like it's a big cover up. And I think the idea is that when the Empire was formed, they just took over the planet and they claimed that it was an Imperial mining facility. And whatever was going on on that ship, it was just something super secret. I think the reason why Cassian kept his identity secret for so long, the fact that he was from that planet, is because Marva drilled the fear into him that the Empire would hunt him down for killing that particular officer, even though he himself wasn't really to blame for that. But there could be something larger going on in the flashbacks they haven't fully revealed yet. You can let me know in the comments if you think it was just like that one thing the way they showed us in the episode or if there was something else that's way more secret that they haven't fully revealed yet. But I think the whole idea with the Empire sweeping that under the rug in the past is meant to dovetail with the officer in the present who tries to sweep the murder of the two officers under the rug. Most of the places and the things that they talk about in the first couple of episodes are brand new stuff that they created for this series. Like there's a couple things that existed before but for the most part it's all brand new stuff. Although the hallways in this cantina that he walks into do kind of look like they're shaped like a Star Destroyer. Then after he kills the guards we go to the Ferrix planet which is also within the same system that the same corporation owns. But it seems like most of the planet is used for general scrap processing. The brand new droid character is named B2 Emo. We also see him in the flashbacks. Way shinier in the flashbacks too. They'll be selling a toy of him soon if they aren't already. He's voiced by Dave Chapman who's also done voice acting in Star Wars before. He did the voice of BB-8 in the sequel movies and he also worked on the Rogue One movie. Obviously that's the sequel to the events of Andor so big connection there. It shocks one of the animals that's pissing on it R2-D2 style. And when it says that this is inside the free trade sector, like I explained, there are parts of the galaxy that corporations control and they're kind of neutral but kind of not at the same time. Like they still have to pay a lot of taxes to the Empire and they service the Empire's requests. But mostly they're there serving their own corporate interests. Like that's what they care about more than anything. So it's just an area of the galaxy that the Empire doesn't directly control. Like they only get involved if things get really crazy. Which makes it easier for people like Cassian, people like Luthen, Stellan Skarsgård's character, who are trying to create this rebellion to actually operate. That's why you have a lot of characters like Ahsoka who travel to the Outer Rim or like Luke Skywalker who's in hiding in the Outer Rim. Because even though this is taking place in the mid rim, they let you know that there just aren't a lot of empire out here. That's even more true in the outer rim. Like the further out you go, the more space there is, the harder it is for the empire to police that area. So it just becomes way easier for really important characters to hide out in the outer rim. The scrapyards seem like they contain scraps from all kinds of imperial, non-imperial ships. I'm sure there's some easter eggs for Clone Wars stuff in the background too, like really old ships. When he mentions all these characters, Jezzy, Fermi are his friends, Marva, Fiona Shaw's character is kind of like his surrogate mother becomes his surrogate mother. The Brasso character is his best friend that winds up helping him escape later in the episode. The whole idea is that this town is basically kind of like a mining town but it's for the scrapyards. Like everybody who lives here works in and around the scrapyards. And the whole thing with this elaborate lie that he creates with his Brasso friend is just to show you some of the skills he has in talking himself into situations and out of situations like this. 
Like, he's a real fast talker, engaged in a lot of spy craft, so that's why Luthen wants him. Like, oh, you seem like the guy I'm here to talk to, the person with the special skills that I need. Then we travel to Morlana 1, the planet where the corporate headquarters for this particular corporation has their security force. The troop transports that you see flying in the background, the ones we also see later in the episode 2, also seem similar to the designs from the prequel movies, like an evolution of the ones from the prequel movies, just a little bit smaller. But this whole scene is just meant to set up the whole personality of the Cyril Karn character, this inspector character, who's kind of like the Inspector Javert of the series to make a Les Mis reference. The guy that just like won't let it go, like he's obsessed with finding Cassie and Andor. Obviously it becomes a bigger thing at the end of episode 3. Like it's now his life's mission to find Cassie and Andor. If he seemed obsessed before, that's nothing compared to what it's going to be like probably for the rest of the episodes. In all of his superior's dialogue, is just meant to get across the idea that the Empire is way worse. Like, however bad their corporation might be, like, they seem like pretty big dirtbags. The Empire is way worse. They don't want them getting up in their business, so they're just going to brush this little problem right under the rug. Obviously, by the end of Episode 3, that goes out the window. Like, with all the attacks, these explosions, this big fight that happens on the Ferrix planet, the Empire probably will get involved. But his whole speech and a lot of what Luthen says later in the episode when Cassian's whole speech about how he's able to steal from the Empire is just meant to hammer home the idea of how fat and lazy the Empire has gotten in their superiority for the last many years. Like they've been in power for so long that the Empire has grown too big, too overconfident, and the people within the Empire that formed the Rebellion use that against them. So his boss is meant to be like one example of a bunch of different types of people all over the galaxy and explain how the Rebellion was able to use that against the Empire. Because if everybody was as hardcore as Karn and the other sergeant here, it probably would have been way harder for the Rebellion to actually form. Then we meet Adria Ronha's Bix character who has this like weird chemistry going on with Cassie and Andor. They aren't together or anything like that, but it seems like that's going to change eventually. She's a mechanic who just seems like she's going to eventually help Cassian in the formation of the Rebellion. Like, she's the contact that Luthen uses for all of his black market dealings, and Cassian sort of uses that to piggyback in to meet Luthen. Cassian also says he's going to come back to the planet eventually, he'll find some way. And also, in the trailers, you have the Imperial characters getting involved on Ferrix with Bix's character, so it seems like she's going to be a much bigger part of the plot going forward as well. And the way they explain the Star Path unit that he's trying to sell to Luthen is that it's a navigation unit that allows them to track the movements of the entire Imperial fleet within like a giant part of the galaxy. Obviously very critical for a group of people trying to create a rebellion. Because they have to leave it in the warehouse at the end of episode 3, we don't see anybody go back for it. Bix might wind up picking it up later. Like it's still there. We didn't see it get crushed, so it still exists. They have that whole drama with her current boyfriend, Tim, that winds up selling out Cassie and Andor. He gets his just desserts. Like, that's what you get for being a rat, even though they want you to sympathize with him just like a little bit. When he mentions Wobani, that's actually one of the few Easter eggs in the episode. It's an Easter egg for Rogue One and for Obi-Wan Kenobi. The name Wobani is an anagram of Obi-Wan, but it's also the exact same planet from the opening of the Rogue One movie. It's the prison planet that Jin Erso was being held at. They introduce you to some of Cassian's friends in and around the town, people that he owes money to, just to give you an idea for what his life has been like these last several years. Until Luthen recruits him to help him form the rebellion, Cassian doesn't have anything to do with the actual rebellion or the resistance. He's just doing all these things to try and track down his sister. Like, that's why he's running around all over the place borrowing money from everyone. As far as I can remember, they don't reference him having a sister during the events of Rogue One at all, so what might end up happening by the end of this series, maybe season 1, season 2, he'll eventually find that sister. Like, that's his basic arc in all this. Like, he doesn't care too much about the Rebellion right now. He does hate the Empire, but he's not like Luthen. He doesn't have grand plans. All he wants is to find his sister. Luthen sounds like the very high-ranking Imperial figure who actually wants to form the legit Rebellion. In the way they set his character up, it kind of seems like he's this hidden figure that you didn't hear about before, like they wrote him into the canon, obviously, for the series. But they're trying to say that he's the person who started everything. Like, he's the person who gave the idea to Mon Mothma and then to Bail Organa. Like, he's the person that got them on board. And then, together, they all worked to create the Rebellion. Couple of side notes, love the blue ramen-looking noodles that this worker is eating. The Imperial Census is from six years ago. Obviously, this is an older version of Cassian Andor than we saw in the flashbacks, but much younger than the one that we see in present day. The Galactic Census would be the Empire trying to or attempting to catalog every single person living in the galaxy. But obviously, obviously, there are going to be some gaps in their information. Like, obviously, they missed Ahsoka. They missed people like Luke Skywalker. He wouldn't be on that census. 
you just have to picture Darth Vader reading over the census like, hmm, Luke Skywalker, that name sounds familiar. Skywalker, where did I last hear that name? A couple of different characters in the episode reference Chobb as if he's like this really famous person in the galaxy or a deity that everybody worships. But the Chobb name is brand new into the Star Wars canon, like they wrote it into this series. So you can let me know if you think it's a really important person or like this deity that a group of people worship. And a lot of the stuff that Cassian does, like the really shady stuff or him swapping ID logs in the ship here, it's just to show you some of the spy craft skills that he has that Luthen wants so badly. Like, oh wow, you're actually pretty good at this. Why don't you come with me? I need your help. Also love the bell worker, like seems like he really, really gets into his job. Like all he does is just ring the bell in the morning once and at the end of the day to signify the end of work. But he really, really gets into his job. We finally meet the Marva character played by Fiona Shaw, who most of you will remember from the Harry Potter movies. She's the surrogate mother that winds up rescuing him in the flashbacks when he went into the ship to try and to destroy it. And they do this funny thing with Cassie and Andor's backstory where she starts talking to him like, how did they find out that you were from Canari? We didn't tell anybody about that except we told a whole bunch of people. The reason why everybody thinks that he's from Fest is because when the Rogue One movie came out, they said that he was from Fest. So like that's the way that the Star Wars people wrote it into the canon. But I think what happened is when they created the Andor series, they wanted to create this more dramatic backstory for the character. So they just explained that he'd been lying this whole time. And that's why there were records of him being from Fest when really he's from this Canari planet. They introduced the sergeant character, love how trigger happy he is, like he and Karn together just want to go so overboard trying to catch this one person. How many people do we need? Do you think a couple will be enough? No, we better take like 12, maybe 14 people. Then when they actually start flying to the Ferrix planet and they're briefing the other officers, it seems like they're playing Karn kind of like Lieutenant Gorman from Aliens, just with like a darker spin on him. Like the super green, higher ranking, really awkward person trying to do a bad job of leading a bunch of more experienced grunts. We finally meet Stellan Skarsgård's Luthen Rail character. As far as I know, he's just a really high-ranking Imperial figure. They haven't completely explained his backstory in the Star Wars canon yet, but I think we'll learn about that in the next couple of episodes. And like I said, he's the person who has this grand plan in mind to form an actual rebellion. So that's why he's dealing in all these black market items, like why he's willing to pay so much money for this special Imperial control unit so that they can track all the Empire's movements around all these sectors. And they have that whole speech with each other where they both kind of explain the ethos and how the rebellion was able to do what it did. Like the empire is so fat and lazy, so overconfident. It's so easy to steal from them. It's so easy to walk under their nose and get away with all this stuff. They also want to show you how resourceful Luthen's character is, how he's been able to get away with all this stuff for so long. Being such a high ranking figure inside the empire, naturally you'd be heavily watched. So we'd have to be very good at what he did to go for this long without being found out. The whole fight in the warehouse was great, just the way they filmed it, the way it all went down. But the even funnier thing is that when they get to drop on Karn, all these inexperienced officers here, he smashes his comm because he literally just learned that lesson from Luthen. Like Luthen's like, give me your comm, smashes it. His friend from before also winds up helping them escape by tying up the troop transport so that it winds up destroying himself, RIP to that grunt officer who went back to get it. And I think they wind up taking out most of their squad that they brought with them through the course of the episode with all the different explosions. But obviously these first three episodes are just meant to show you how Cassie and Andor got involved in the rebellion itself, like, or the formation of the rebellion. It hasn't actually become the rebellion yet. I still think it's called the resistance. I believe in next week's episode, we'll see the empire for the first time. Like there's a couple big Imperial characters during the series. I think we'll meet them in next week's episode because of what happened on the planet, the big firefight that they had. And we also might go back to Coruscant and see Mon Mothma's character, some of the other big characters that'll be involved in the series. But if you spotted any other big Easter eggs or references during the episodes that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. In general, the series was built to have fewer like direct references to like the really big Star Wars stuff. Like we're not going right back to Tatooine, like, ah, oh, we went back to Tatooine again. Most of all this is meant to be brand new stuff. So like if it doesn't look familiar, that's on purpose. But like we will see Mon Mothma, we'll go back to Coruscant, we'll see the Imperial Senate. So there will be like a lot of familiar stuff. We'll see if like the Emperor or a, a version of Princess Leia eventually shows up. I think that Bail Organa will definitely show up with the later episodes. The episodes will be one per week after this up to episode 12 in the finale. So my episode four video will post next week after they release it. I've got a bunch of other big videos I'm working on this week. My She-Hulk video will post on Thursday. I've got new Lord of the Rings. My House of the Dragon episode six video will post on Sunday. So make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss all that. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode six trailer video and click here for my Mandalorian season three trailer video. Mandalorian season three also starting in February, big reminder. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.